Hello and welcome to this special conversation for International Women's Day um, titled The Right to Roam, Women and Free Expression. My name is Hannah Trevartan, I'm Events and Partnerships Manager at English Pen and I'm really delighted to be speaking to Margie Orford and Kerry Nadokte, who I am huge admirers of. Margie Orford is an author, activist and independent scholar. She is the author of the internationally acclaimed Claire Hart novels, a literary crime series which has been translated into 10 languages. She's an award-winning journalist and has published non-fiction books for children as well as essays on violence and literature. She also completed a PhD at the University of East Anglia during the lockdown last year. Her doctoral essay, which centres on three of her crime novels, is titled Nostalgia for the Future, um, and it critically reassesses theories of trauma in relation to the post-colonial in the context of South Africa, where extreme levels of violence against women endure after the legal end of apartheid. She's also a member of the advisory board of the Johannesburg Review of Books and was a patron of Rape Crisis in South Africa, president of PEN South Africa and a member of the executive board of PEN International. She is co-author of the PEN International Women's Manifesto, which we're going to be talking about today. She now lives in London and working on her memoir. Kerry Nadokati is from the northwest of Ireland, but now lives in the middle in an old railway cottage with her partner and dog. She has written for The Guardian, The Irish Times, Winter Papers, Caught by the River and others. She's the author of this very wonderful book, Thin places which we'll be hearing about today. To start with, I'm going to um, pull out a quote actually from the Penn Women's Manifesto, which kind of is the start for this discussion. And um, in it, it says that the first and founding principle of the Penn Charter um, is literature knows no frontiers. These frontiers were traditionally thought of as borders between countries and people. For many women in the world, and for almost all women until relatively recently, the first. And the last and perhaps the most powerful frontier was the door of the house she lived in, her parents or her husband's home. For women to have the have free speech, the right to read, the right to write, they need to have the right to roam physically, socially and intellectually. Margie, I was wondering as co-author of the manifesto, could you discuss how the manifesto came to be and the inspirations that allowed this um, really important document to, to take form? Well, it came, it came to be, I think, primarily because of what the election of Jennifer Clement as the president of Penn about five years ago. And she was the first woman to be the president of Penn in its now 100 year history. So the oldest, one of the oldest NGOs in the world, one of the oldest free speech organizations in the world. First time we had a woman president. Politically, the, the sort of agenda was her, her kind of platform was to look at the role of women writers, what was happening. We could see um, in the work that we'd been doing, there was a kind of particular targeting of women activists, particularly in South America and in, in Africa and Asia too. It was very gendered and a kind of relegation of women writers. You know, women writers kind of appear, then they write and then they vanish. Um, as if there's no history and as if there's no kind of continuity. I mean, Virginia Woolf has written about this. Um, I worked in the 90s and early 2000s on an anthology called Women Writing Africa, which was that old feminist archive retrieval project. And so we worked um, together on that and with a kind of consultation group from all over the, the world, we're working on that man manifesto because problems of gender, gendered violence, various things kind of have refracted differences in different places in the world. To me, his violence always has a grammar, it has a kind of location, it has a particular inflection of the place that it comes from, but there is a kind of commonality of exclusion with patriarchy. And so we thought about it a great deal. And one of the, you know, the first thing was to take the, the original charter drawn up by H.G. Wells and all sorts of fabulous people, which was very much looking at how borders between people stop our understanding. And this idea of the frontier within the self, the, the self-censorship that many women do, came, really came to the fore, because I think you need two things to write. The one is literally the freedom to not be imprisoned for saying what you think. Um, growing up in South Africa, being an activist in South Africa in the 80s, I was 
absolutely familiar with what happened to writers if they spoke out of turn. You went to jail, you could be assassinated. So it's, there's a very simple politics about that. But there's another idea of a kind of expansive freedom, a world without borders. I think Kerry's book gets this so wonderfully of being in the world and allowing one's mind, one's heart, one's soul, one's psyche, all the things that make us create to expand into infinity. Not all men have this right, but many men have it and many take it. And it, it gives a kind of, um, if we think right from Odysseus, it gives you the idea to just chart whatever waters you wish to. That for many women is curtailed. So this idea of roaming without limit, without intent, without time limit was very important. There's a kind of freedom mm. to that word to roam um, that carries many layers. It's like a palimpsest of freedoms, which to me gives you literally the freedom to do it, but a kind of psychic confidence that the world, the universe is yours. And we wanted that grandeur and the privacy of it. And very importantly, a physical safety, because we know the kind of dangers physically for women if they transgress um, the limits of what are given to them by their society. And we know the mental dangers. This idea of self-censorship is very, very strong subjects that are taboo, many of which Kerry writes about. Things about violence, things about shame, things about sexuality, whether your body is your own, all of that sort of thing. So it, to me, that word is the kind of fulcrum for a whole complex range of freedoms. And PEN specifically is not only a human rights organization, although it is, guided by the charter it's also a kind of worldwide republic of writers if I could put it like that mm -hmm. and so the idea of creativity and you know, that other kind of freedom that slow freedom perhaps Freud asked what do women want I can tell him we <laughs> want to roam that's what we want we want to be free Thank you, Margie. Carrie, what does the idea of, of roaming and the freedom to roam mean, mean to you? As Margie has said, it's so apparent in this gorgeous book of yours, the how much being embedded within nature, being part of nature, allowed you to, to explore some very difficult things that had happened in, in your life. Um, but to my mind, it also feels like they're part of this this catalyst um, for creation as well for you? So much of what Margie has just so eloquently and really movingly said echoed very deeply within me. And I love that idea of the palimpsest type of experience that both literature and existence allow for. I think specifically with within the, the area of women and freedom, freedom to roam, and I think for me, the idea of freedom to roam really does begin in the self. So Thin Places, um, it is an exploration of myself in place, but I think that exploration really began when I kind of properly gave myself permission in a way to actually roam within my own experience, within my lived experience, and that's where it began. So I think in order for me to properly try and find my place in the world and to go out into the world with any kind of courage or resolution or really with any kind of proper sense of identity I had to really journey back within my own self and I needed to give myself the freedom to actually look around and as Margie said without without there being a definite um without there being a an exact outcome. So to really look back over the experiences of one's own life as a woman, as a woman who's been silenced, perhaps kept from places, is really where the roaming begins. Because we look around inside our, our lived experience, we look in our memory, we look in, in those dark kind of murky places that we've been in. And of course, they, they're psychological places first and foremost. And I think for me, beginning with looking back and, and going in and out of places in the past really gave me the 
the sense of strength and courage to go out into the world and to be in the world without any definite um, plan or any outcome um, and to try and find ways to feel safe. And I think that's a really interesting point, Margie, that you've made. It is about women, pen is, and freedom, but it's also this kind of like a, a murmuration of writers. And I think in writing, um, we, we're always going into a sort of a roaming type mode. There is a demand to feel free. I, I remember um, Amy Lippetrot, who's a, a, a writer I really admire, um, spoke to me about how that writing works and how when you're writing drafts, how it works. And she said, you really need to think of the first draft as being completely yours and you're going into what you've experienced. And then from then on in, it, sh it shape shifts. The second draft, you're thinking about the other people that you've written about. The third draft, you're thinking about your audience and who you're giving it to. So it's almost like when we write, as women specifically, I think, our first draft of anything is where we have that freedom to really properly go into the places that we need to, deep within us, deep within our past, deep within our collective past, intergenerationally, um, as, as, a, as our sex really, and what our sex has been put through over the years. And I think that writing and roaming, I'm intrigued by that link and how we, how we enter into dialogue with ourself, with other women and with the world. It's really shifting right now. Um, that's, that's quite inspirational. <laughs> it's quite hopeful, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I think there's, I think that the manifesto goes on to say that without women's stories, the world is both wanting and bereft. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, this particular political juncture that we are at, political in the biggest, in the broadest sense, mm. the climate crisis, real um, examinations of um, the colonial past, of various mm. things, of how to do, deal with violence, how to deal with all sorts of things. That sort of inward mapping, a sort of inward topography that we don't have enough of, of women's experience yeah. and how they've navigated these things is absolutely essential for kind of reimagining, you know, yeah. because the imagination is always a rearrangement of, yeah. of things that have been there before. So one of the things that was so politically important I think for me around this women's manifesto was to say there's a whole realm of the experience. There's a wonderful Chinese book some years ago called, and it's from a, uh, in a phrase, an idiom saying women hold up half the sky. I yeah. really get the feeling the sky is falling. So it's like we need some help to know how yeah. we're going to hold up um, half yeah. the sky. If we look at this absolute crisis of masculinity in the far right yeah. that's coalesced around yeah. Trump and the storming of the Capitol and various things. These are very deep tectonic things. So you're talking about this inner exploration to find what's there, to find what's yeah. been there in history is politically and creatively essential to kind of reimagine things and to say this happens and to not make history disappear each time. I mean, anyone who's gone and sought their foremothers in literature you find them there's like hundreds and thousands of them and yeah. I was saying how do they get disappeared these women writers yeah. and it is like that phrase comes from Chile under Pinochet originally how do they get disappeared it's a, it's a political thing so the creativity of making that space can dissolve that if you think of some a writer like Elif Shafak for instance yes. yeah. and the amount of work that she's done with kind of asserting the centrality of female experience in, mm -hmm. in Turkey and its authority. That's the other thing. Yeah. Where, where in that manifesto, what we were thinking and in the writing that I've done about violence against women is that we are authors. We are writers. We are authors. We are authorities of our experience and we are authorities of this world that we live in. So it's a claiming of authority that's not dictatorial, yeah. but which asserts knowledge and with that knowledge, a power to be in the world and to shift it, to change it. Yeah, and I'm I'm really drawn as well. Elif was a good example because I'm really drawn um, to thinking about how women um, women and landscape kind of 
where they meet, it's a very delicate dance, specifically at the moment. So, for example, what we're seeing right now is a, an increased um, female narrative, and we're seeing it come from a number of different places across the globe, but it's always linked with the land. It's always linked with what the land has experienced, as well as what the woman's body and has experienced um, and I wonder if there is that thing of you know like, like with that beautiful quote that you've you've just given the Chinese quote where women are so of the land we, we, we really are kind of very deeply embedded I, I still feel it anyway and I still feel a lot of the women I admire are and so at this moment of real crisis where the land, what lands have been through, what they're still experiencing, what people on the land have been through, what non-human species have been through, it almost seems right that the, the female voice needs to be the voice that will carry us through that because they are so strongly linked. And I'm thinking of people like um, Laurette Savoy, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, where I'm from here, you know, Dern Negriffin, Sinead Gleason, who, all of their writing is of the self, it's of the landscape of the self, and it's an internal um, mapping, but they're very much embedded in the place that they're from and, and what that land has gone through. Human rights and land are obviously completely intrinsically linked. And I'm intrigued by that link and how freedom to roam um, begins in the self and is extended out. And how do we ensure that safety, especially at a time when borders and keeping people out and keeping people apart, um, even before the pandemic had become such an important thing, such a central theme. I think that's so interesting. I think often like, I think men traditionally, when we talk about writing about nature have been seen as this kind of explorer and kind of, yeah. if you allow like conqueror of, of this kind of vistas that they see and kind of taking, um, ownership over it whereas Kerry you know what you've been articulating is that that women are are doing something different which is about how do you how do you exist how do you have this this ecosystem um this connection with the land which is which is not so much about about owning it but it's about the experience of of being within it um and and I think as well um, Margie, I'm, I'm going to quote you back at you, which is, um, I read a, a wonderful thing which you wrote, which is, a, women, uh, a woman bearing witness to her own experience is a political act. And these kind of, um, these, these kind of conversations that we're having about mapping our own experiences, kind of uh, our inner, inner maps, and, and then projecting them out is, is political if those experiences um, are not so so widely heard or have been given the space before. Margie, are there any kind of writers that you had in mind when you were kind of crafting um, the Women's Manifesto who, who also speak to that idea about um, women bearing witness and, and political acts? There, there were a number. Um, and the, the ones that I brought up and who sort of shaped my understanding of literature are actually many African writers. I mean, I grew up in Namibia and in South Africa. And, you know, with the, the sort of extremity of segregation that you had with apartheid and a kind of, um, you know, the sort of colonial and then apartheid ideas of the land and who could be own it and who couldn't. And the, the, the sort of physicalness of partition was so brutal and so violent so to, in order to understand the country and then the continent that I lived in and was shaped, have been shaped by, it was African writers to whom I turned, invaded, frontiers crossed without invitation. I mean, in a way that's mm. what the essence of colonialism. And so I like the friction in that word frontier, which comes from the, it's not a neutral word. It no. raises many histories that come and that sort of aliveness and the kind of difficulty that you constantly have to navigate around a word like that, I think are very important. And then a person who's, whose work I absolutely love, who goes into the interior and uses the body, the private suffering of madness and dementedness and um, power is um, Titi Dangaremba, um, mm -hmm. Zimbabwean no novelist. 
And her first book, Nervous Conditions, um, the title of which she took from uh, Sartre's introduction to Fanon, in which he says the condition of the native is a nervous condition, in which she looks at this unbelievably disordered eating in, in the protagonist of that book in Zimbabwe in the 1970s and 80s, as you've got this rising civil war and this kind of conflict is internalized, the conflict of the land, to go back to what Kerry has taken in extremely riven sectarian places, is often internalized and performed by and experienced yeah. in women's bodies because they stand in for the, you know, the, all those complex things that they're doing. And then Titi's most recent book, This Mournable Body, mm. in, it's a trilogy, The Book of Not, and then This Mournable Body, she tracks this kind of post-colonial um, experience in Zimbabwe from the 80s, 70s and 80s into the very recent present. And Titi, I have to, I'm very excited. She's going to be, um, at UEA for a year as uh, the first chair of African literature. And I was tremendously excited to be on the committee, which we selected her and put her forward. Also because she writes, she's doing that miraculous thing of writing of and for Zimbabwe, of and for Africa, but for the world. If you want mm -hmm. to understand the fractures that we need to deal with here now, she would be the person to read. I think some of the, the hysteria, I think is a good word for it, um, the return of the repressed that we're seeing in England in particular about um, decolonization and stuff is finally the violence of, of colonialism, which started in Ireland with the English and mm -hmm. has been all over the world. It's played out there, it's returning, the periphery has returned to the center. It's an inner conflict that has to be resolved and we hope will be resolved uh, with compassion, not the way it's going. Mm -hmm. Kerry, can I pick up some, ask you something kind of, kind of which picks up on Margie's point, which is about, um, about violence, but also um, silence as, as well. In thin places, there's this extremely moving um, section where you talk about um, Irish women and the silence of Irish women and, and how that is being broken. Um, and in it, you say, um, we have been forced into silence. We have been made to feel unclean, unworthy. We have been made to feel like we are not even really here. We have been beaten and abused, guilted and terrified. We have had the parts of us that are ours and ours alone ripped out from inside of us, like a page from a story deemed unworthy of being given voice. We have had to keep on and on and on. We are women. We are the women of Ireland and we are breaking the centuries of silence. Um, I wanted to ask about, I mean, about, about you and, and kind of breaking those silences but also the other women in Ireland who are doing, doing remarkable work, who are kind of now speaking out. Um, are there any kind of particular writers that you have um, a particular fellowship with, um, particularly in this space? I think um, at the moment, the women of Ireland that have the most important voice uh, or that should be given the most important voice are survivors. So what we've been experiencing for a long, long time is silence and no breaking of it. And when women do try to break it um, again and again, they're put down. And that's by the state, that's by other men, that's by family members, that's by the people who have abused them. So there are a lot of women who are doing really good things in this area. So um, Keelan Hughes, um, Republic of Shame, incredible. I would highly recommend that people begin there. Um, and obviously that's from a very uh, political and very researched point of view. Um, you've got people like Amri Nahuran, who is um, a writer also from the border from Donegal, just in the south, but who looks a lot at, again, what women were put through when they were with a baby um, and children being taken away. Um, and obviously women being taken away from themselves, being taken away from their family, their sense of self, their sense of community. 
So I think that they're definitely two writers I would um, really begin with. But then Elaine Feeney, she's kind of predominantly a poet, but novelist as well. But she's written and she recently wrote an incredibly moving piece about survivors for The Guardian. So I think we're seeing from all of these different strands a real desire to give voice to what people have been through, specifically women. Um, and even, even on the level of just the openness that's becoming more apparent in Ireland, you know, I'm hearing it again and again and again, and it's, it's like a resounding bell. We're being called to, we're being called to listen just as much as we're being called to allow people to speak. Because I think when we create a space in which survivors can, particularly women, can feel like they can voice their truth, it doesn't end there and it doesn't begin there either because it begins in the creation of this safe place. But after that, the ripples and the repercussions will carry on for a long time. And if you put something into a space and if you're not held safely, and if people don't want to listen to you or if they want to question your truth, that can be exceptionally, that can be almost more threatening and dangerous than by not giving the space. So I think we're in this very funny situation where we've, people are beginning to speak, but we're still not properly at the point where we're all ready to compassionately and fully listen and actually listening isn't where it ends because there are many steps after listening in a survivor's journey towards healing and in a country's journey towards healing. I think we've begun, we've made some very vital steps, but we're a, num you know, we're a number of steps away from making Ireland and other places, you know, Africa, everywhere else that women's voices need heard. We're a number of steps away from making it a safe enough space for survivors. That's uh, what you were saying, Kerry, about the necessity of listening and how to do that. Um, my understanding of free speech and how you work with it in a complex society in which there are great differentials of power um, between religions in Ireland, between races as it was in South Africa, between mm -hmm. men and women, if we're talking about most homes, is freedom of speech, um, which is part of the, the kind of bedrock of human rights, uh, the sort of foundational right. But with all rights go responsibilities. Mm. And for me, in having worked around free speech issues for a very long time, um, what you need is a reciprocal duty to listen. Free speech, just speaking is kind of, yeah. you end up sort of babble or, or bullying, a kind of noise. So I was imagine it as a kind of Mobius strip in which mm. you speak and it is returned and comprehended. It works through the body of another person, yeah. through their mind and returns. People are not always going to agree. No. But what they can agree on, and this was how I tried to do the work I did when I was working with Penn in South Africa, was to create a nonpartisan and spa a safe discursive space in which complex conversations could be had. And one of the key elements of that, which I think this is perhaps why writing is so important, is that it takes time. Yeah. It takes time. Anybody giving testimony to violence that they have endured themselves, we know how long it takes, how many silences there are between the words, how words can't say all the things. Yeah. They can represent some of, but they can't reproduce that and we might not want to reproduce, but there's, there needs to be time in which speech can be slow and often incoherent. You know, I saw that in the, in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa, where they actually set up a separate hearing for what had happened to women. And it was partially successful and partially a disaster and partially pure compassionate genius because it was people uh, trying to find a way in which experiences of, um, often sexual abuse. And then you see how women stand in for the whole community because yeah. a raped woman 
an assaulted woman has not just been shamed herself, yeah. she stands in for a, especially a patriarchal society. So yeah. the whole society is shamed. We saw that in yeah. Bosnia yeah. Um, in, in the thing. So how that can be framed is complex. And in my experience, the, the listening it requires is to allow that stuff to go in. Yeah. to absorb to absorb it but not to claim not to claim it as one's own just to allow it to because it's often too much for the person yeah. who's writing or speaking she just yeah. needs somewhere where it can rest for a minute yeah. and come back not as something awful and unbearable and unspeakable mm -hmm. but something that can be held mm -hmm. it can't be unhappened it can't no. be undone but no. it can be shaped yeah. and given a form in which it's comprehensible. Because I think the, the writing, especially yes. writing around trauma, is an attempt at comprehension, even to comprehend what you've gone through yourself. Yeah. And that's the valuable thing for other, uh, the, the gift we return when we write about these hard things is a way in which comprehension can happen perhaps yes and it's uh, they're fantastic points and really very helpful um and how you framed the duality and the dance of compassion i think is really what you're, you're talking about there because i think very often the onus can be placed on the person who has been through deep trauma it's like you you process it yourself as best you can then you give it to the world in the hope that it might help someone or it's never really just about you yourself you're speaking for yourself but as you say your your story is part of a chorus and I think that what we have to be very careful of um across across the world but I know from experience in Ireland is that we have to make sure that the voices that are that are coming to the fore are the right voices in a way the right voices as in you know, if we want to speak of survivors, if we want to speak of women who've experienced deep trauma, in a way, the, the truth comes from them. But when they've given it, I suppose the onus does shift and it shifts towards the entire society. Because as you, as you spoke of so beautifully, um, when you put a woman through some form of abuse, particularly, I think, sexual abuse or abuse that comes out of that area, that experience scars the whole landscape it scars the whole community and again and again when we were talking of sort of uh, mother and baby homes recently in Ireland the question that was repeatedly being asked was where where were the the family members where were the people within community mm -hmm. where were the voices of other people when people were going through this so trying to get the balance right between not placing not placing too much um, necessity on, or too much responsibility on those who do speak out and those who break silence, allowing them to speak out, but also, as you've said, allowing them the need to, re to retreat or to, to just set the thing down that they've been carrying so that it can be reshaped by that beautiful kind of act of compassionate listening that really does have a place in and everyone's healing collectively, you know, across the world, really. Um, because what happens in Africa affects us all. What happens in China affects us all because we're, we're much more um, linked to one another than what we often like to believe, um, human to human, but also human to non-human. And what we're doing on all of the sort of beings that we share the earth with is having an effect on us. Rebecca Tomosh writes about this um, really kind of wonderfully in a lot of her, in her new essay collection that we, we're living through this incredible um, time where we're, we're, it's almost anticipatory grief. We're losing things, we're losing our sense of identity and that's coexisting with the species that we're losing and it affects us. It, it, it affects our being. And as you say, that goes right back to colonialism. It's still being carried out. And these voices that are coming to the fore are, they're essential, but what is almost as essential is how we 
hold their suffering and how we remold it mm -hmm. and make it lighter for them. It will never go away, but um, it may be easier to carry in some ways. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, I think we're running out of time, which is such a shame because I <laughs> would love to just hear the two of you speak to each other. For, for it's a been month. really lovely. But <laughs> maybe, maybe in the after times we will be able to meet in person, oh, like we yes. used to do in the before time. <laughs> I mm. have um, sort of one last quote and question, um, and then I'm going to ask Kerry to to read from from her, her from her book, Thin Thin Places. Um, which is particularly resonant with, with the idea of listening. So I would like to encourage everyone to, to listen to, to Kerry's wonderful words. Um, I want to pick up on something that Mariama Barr said, which is books knit generations together in the same continuing effort that leads to progress. What the so two part question is what, what books and writers give you hope for the future? Um, who, who is going to kind of, change the world with with their words in in your opinions um and also how do we listen more as well picking up on that that thing that you've, you've both said so eloquently well the person i've had in mind a great deal recently is antigone and actually i heard kerry talking about antigone mm. on the radio and antigone i've thought about since i was at school and played in the chorus around that play. Mm -hmm. she, she fascinated me how Judith Butler took her up with Antigone's claim, which counters the sort of closed family circle that Freud speculated around of the Oedipal complex, you know, mother, the sort of romance of mother, father, child. Of, and uh, what Judith Butler puts forward is this idea of Antigone's claim to kinship, to um, our duties to each other, to our duties to the bodies of each other as the foundational form of civilization. And what I love about Antigone is her courage and her claiming of authority, like absolute claiming of authority that if people breach the sort of laws of family, the laws of nature, you take it over, which goes back, I think, perhaps to Kerry's thing about the mother and baby's home. But recommendations of writers now, I mean, Sisi Dangaremba, absolutely, absolutely. Mazar Mangista's uh, book that was also uh, shortlisted on the Booker Prize, um, The King, The Shadow King. Mm -hmm. You know, this unpacking of this history I knew nothing about, little tiny fragments of the Italians in, in um, Ethiopia, but this other history. And then a book that Kerry and I have been bonding on Twitter over by a, a writer, a Danish writer who'd sort of disappeared called Tova Ditlifsen, whose novel of faces is totally fantastic as is her uh, memoir, which gives this absolutely frank account of herself. And then there's another lovely, wonderful Norwegian, uh, Danish writer, Dota Nors, who writes with such precision, these kind of like, Microvision advent calendars opens this little door and you're into this world, this whole world, which and the story can be 500 words, 1,500 words long. So I would read those. And then for, for uh, readers who don't know Asiya Chabar, who don't know Maria, uh, Maria Mabar, read these incredible African writers who located on the continent. I love the diaspora writers as well, but Another is Bushi Macheta, who was Nigerian originally, came to the UK. There's these worlds within worlds within worlds which can only illuminate ours. And then, of course, Kerry's book and that marvelous book that I loved, which I thought of when I was listening, Thin, Thin Places, which gives this kind of segue between nature, the outside world and the inside world, the outside topography and the inside topography, was um, Milkman. Yeah. By... Um, Anna Burns. Anna Burns. So a generation before yours. Yeah. Um, I found so much resonance in that. And then reading your, you know, those two together, giving a sense of the feeling of Ireland. Mm. Anyway, so those, I mean, I could go on, but those, those, those are, those are my Antigone recommendations. Women who mm -hmm. claim a quiet authority and then they do it. 
wonderful. So, so many um, books for me to put on my list, um, which I knew you would have, Margie. So um, I'm always drawn to very strong female narrative voice um, and probably more so in this last very kind of surreal year that we've had. Um, so I think some of the things that I've been gaining a lot of comfort and nourishment from have been women who write about where they are both in themselves and within their their world and so so recently I've been reading a lot of like like I mentioned earlier Rebecca Tomosh um I've been reading Nina Minga Powell's absolutely exquisite essay collection um Small Bodies of Water which is due out with Canongate this year and I would thoroughly recommend it um, it, it explores the idea of self and the narrative of um, of colonialism, and it really looks at nature in a way that I've I've never really properly sort of experienced before. Um, so I would thoroughly recommend them. Um, in relation to sort of old favourites, <laughs> I, I really love people like Emily Pine, Sinead Gleeson, Dern Nagrifa. Jan Carson, women who write the story of Ireland, both through their exploration of self, through like magic realism, through history, through through all of these layers of identity that we um, we are made up of, our stories are made up of somehow. But I'm really, I suppose I'm really keen to continuously look at um, people that I I wouldn't otherwise discover. So I, this year I was really delighted to, well, last year to be reading um, a lot of kind of American writers and a lot of um, women who, whose stories have not quite made it properly out there yet. So Mar like loads of Margie's um, suggestions have been really great because I would have read a lot of African writers, but I've realized that predominantly they were male voices, you know, and it's the same with, um, with like a lot of the Japanese writers that I love as well, they've predominantly been male. Whereas I know in Japan specifically in relation to the essay, they've got this incredible history of female writers, but where were, where were they disappeared to, you know? And, and in Duran Nagrifa's book, The Ghost in the Throat, she looks at this idea of where have these stories gone? You know, where have these viewpoints gone? Because They've always been there. They've just been disappeared. They've been made into ghosts, really. And so I suppose what I'm looking for now is anyone who unearths those ghosts and brings them into the necessary light of today. I should say at this point, what we're very much hoping to do with, with the events programme for Penn's Centenary this year is, is to bring some of the extraordinary women from, from Penn's history um, in, into the light, um, I'm sure, most of our members who are listening will know that Penn was founded by this extraordinary woman, um, Catherine Amy Dawson Scott, and there have been lots of, of women in our in our history who have really moved us forward as an organisation and have kind of changed our views or, or taken things um, forward. And we very much want to to make sure that people um, are aware of those wonderful writers as much as we are as people like. H.G. Wells and Donald Goldsworthy and, and the other luminaries who were involved um, in, in Penn and the founding of Penn. And my interesting fact, which I keep trotting out, is that there were more founding uh, members of Penn that were women than men, which I think is quite extraordinary wow. for an organisation founded yeah. 100 years ago. So Incredible. Uh, we, must, we must remember them and celebrate Incredible. them. And it's really interesting that um, Penn is the same age as the Irish border which turns 100 in May. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah. So I'm, I've been really moved by that, um, how to respond to, the, to this, this contested kind of ghost line. Um, and then you've got something like Penn, which is the same age, and it's intriguing. When I was listening to your book, I listened to it on Audible, so oh. I, could, I could roam with you, with the... With the, wow. the and I, I kept on thinking of how marvelous it was the way you evoke that ghost border, this thing that's not there that stumbles people all the yeah. time. And it made me think of the stumble stones in Berlin that were put up yeah. for where, where uh, Jewish people were abducted and murdered in mm -hmm. uh, the Second World War. These stones that 
yeah. make the land carry the traces of yeah. the suffering that's gone there and make you think, draw you into the yeah. story and then ex explain to you. Say, yeah. This is, this is it. This markers. Is it. Yeah. These yeah. really important markers. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. I'm going to read a little bit um, from Thin Places, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read um, a section from the chapter called Hollowing Hallowing. And it's about um, a time where I, the first time where I camped by myself alone after I stopped drinking um, and roamed freely. So I think it kind of, it was a really transformative experience for me, a real cusp moment. And um, St. John's um, Eve is when the veil between two worlds is very thin in Irish tradition and um, something about that sense of roaming physically and in other ways as well. I walk around the fire, one that I myself lit three times on St. John's Day this year. And I think of the circles we all walk over and over. I think of what it means to really let go of something, of what it means to fall back into the curve of a place and let it hold you. The Irish word for fire is closely linked with tinfa, the Irish word for inspiration and for breathing. I think of what these two things need, of what kindles them, I think of what it might mean to leave a place through choice rather than through force or through fire. My St John's fire this year could be seen from most points of Glen Crow, a, sig a signal of a form. I have been thinking so much of beacons. Classically, beacons were fires lit at well-known locations on hills or high places used either as lighthouses to lead folk to safety or for signalling over land that enemies were approaching. From, from where my friend and I stand that June day on the shore, Ballykelly, the village where I spent my teens, the place where I lost a friend to an act of devastating violence, can be seen across the water. Beacons, fires, lighthouses, what message, what signal are our ancestors sending us across the waters between us and them, then and now? What signal are we sending to those in front of us on the other shore? I think about it all. I take every single shard of it and I hold it all in my shaky, sooty hands. I think of how I taught myself just this year, alone, in a different, equally cold dairy house than the one I was petrol bombed in, how to light my first fire. How even after enduring a history in which fire brought terror and destruction, a flame red thread that burned through my crimson bloodline, I found the way back to the flames across a different threshold. There are places in this luminous, aching world that are glassy, like the lakes of a hundred years. They are both the mirror and they are the light that you seek with which to find them. There are places that I know in the exterior and hardened parts of my bones are in fact the fire itself. There are places that are both hollowed and hallowed, all in one. These places are like snowfall in darkness, sensed without being seen. They are not ours, but we are theirs. We are of, not in them. We are, for the most celestial and ancient moment, a part of those places ourselves. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you for that extraordinary reading. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to formally wrap up proceedings and I want to give enormous thanks to, um, to Margie and Kerry for their, their time, their insights, 
um, I am a huge admirer of them and I have to say I was slightly nervous about talking to them <laughs> both today. Um, I was nervous talking to you both as well. <laughs> um, you, could, you never need to be nervous if they're chatterboxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hope our members have enjoyed this conversation um, and um, do seek out the brilliant work of, of Kerry and Margie and the numerous writers they have, um, they have recommended and suggested they will they will change your viewpoints on on the world um, and enrich enrich your reading life very much. So so do do that. Um, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Margie. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It was lovely. Thank you thank very you much for having us.